In this video, we're going to take a look at the new Substance Engine version 8 updates in Substance Designer 2020.2. So first, I want to get started by taking a look at the Curve node. So here, I'm going to hit the space bar, and I'll do a search for Curve, and now I've created a Curve node. You'll notice here that I have this highlight around the node. So if I come over here to Edit, and I go to Preferences, and then finally, I'll take a look at the Projects category, there's a section here for Compatibility Display. And right now, my display is set to Substance Engine v7. So this highlight just simply indicates that this node is not compatible with the Substance Engine v7. So here, if I set my dropdown to v8 and click Apply, you'll see that the highlight goes away. This functionality allows me to just debug my graph for nodes that are not compatible with specific versions of the Substance Engine. So here in this case, I'll set this back to v7 and click Apply. And again, I have my highlight. Now with this new node, you'll notice that we have here in the parameters options for Expose Curve and Apply Curve. The Expose Curve option is the new functionality that is part of Substance Engine 8. If I enable Apply Curve, the node will then behave as it did in previous versions of Substance Designer, where I would need to input a gradient texture. I'm now going to go back to the Expose Curve option, and I can now go and create my curve and adjust points. As I adjust my curve, the node will natively generate the gradient texture. I no longer need to supply a gradient input to the node. With Engine 8, the node will generate the texture itself. Next, we're going to take a look at some updates to the gradient map. So here you can see that I have a gradient linear one plugged into my gradient map. Now I'm also using this new node called cross section, which ships in 2020.2. This node allows me to visualize a slice of the height map information coming into it. And I'm going to use this cross section to illustrate the new interpolation features found in the gradient map. All right, so with my gradient map selected, I'm going to click the gradient editor button. And I'm going to just create a few keys here. And so I'll place one right in the middle. Now you'll notice we have this drop down, which now allows me to change the interpolation type between my keys. So with a value set to linear, which is the default, and if I make an adjustment here, you can see that I get a linear interpolation as shown here by the cross section between my keys. Now I can also change this. So let's just drop this down to flat tangents. And here you can see the result that we have. If we take a look here at this section, we can think of this point with the tangent handles extending out towards the side horizontally to produce that flat tangent. Now I can't manipulate the tangent handles here in the 2D view. However, we've exposed the midpoint from the keys. So notice here with my middle key selected, I can adjust the midpoint value. And this midpoint value is being adjusted between these two keys. In another example, I will select the zero value key point and once again adjust that midpoint value. You can see that the midpoint is being adjusted between the first two keys. Now another option that I have here is to switch to the smooth mode. And you'll notice here that smooth is just going to do a smooth interpolation across all of the keys. So for example here, I'm just going to make uh, just a few extra keys. As I set this to zero, we will get a linear interpolation. And if I move the slider towards one, we'll start to smooth that result. So now we're going to take a look at some new additions to the distance node. So to start, I'm going to create a new distance node. Now, in order to demonstrate this, I am going to create a tile generator. And I'll scroll down here to the size mode. This is also new in 2020.2. And I'm going to set this here to pixel. And then I'll scroll down towards the position. And I'm going to set just a random position x and y offset. And then I'm going to adjust the luminance random. I'll set this to a value of 1. Now I'm going to be using the distance node to create a Voronoi pattern. Using the new pixel size mode is helpful as it allows me to get the smallest seed point for the distance node. Now I'm going to use yet another new node, which is called the threshold node. And I will plug this in and I'm going to use the output of the threshold here for my mask input to my distance. And then I'll take the output of my tile generator and just plug that into the source input of my distance node. Now let's double click the distance node and take a look. So I'm going to set the maximum distance here all the way up to 256. And you'll notice here that we have a new drop down here for the distance mode. And by default, we're using the Euclidean distance. And this is the result that we would get. Here we have a new option here called the Manhattan distance. And you can see 
the result that this is going to produce. Now, there can be circumstances like you see here where I start to get uh, just some artifacting. And so there's not really a great way to handle this. So in my case, I'm just going to jump back over here to the tile generator. And I think I'm just going to try to make a few adjustments to the position. So I'll scroll down to where I have that position random. And I'm just going to make just a slight adjustment here until I see that the artifact has disappeared. So in this case, you can see that I've just removed the artifact. Now let's jump back over here to distance, and that is our Manhattan distance. And so we have a third option, which is called the trebuchet distance. So we'll use this option, and here you can see the different result that we get. Now, once again, I just want to just double check the actual texture, make sure I'm not getting any artifacting, which it looks like it's fairly clean in this particular case. So here, as you can see with the distance node, we now have two new options here with the distance mode setting. Now we're going to take a look at the ability to add default values for input nodes. So here you can see that I have a material. This is a very basic material. I have my outputs here. And the concept is that I'd like to be able to create this base material where other artists on my team can supply their own input data. So for example here, let's take a look at the base color. You'll notice here that I have this base color input node. And if I have this node selected over in the properties underneath the parameters, you'll notice that we now have this new default value system for all input nodes. This allows me to actually set a default value for this base color. So instead of this just being blank, I can actually set any kind of default value system for this material or this input. So let's just say instead of white, I want this to be gray. So I'm just going to set this to 0.5 for my RGB. And you'll notice here for the alpha, I'm just going to keep this set to a value of 1. So now I have my grayscale value. I'm also using an input node here for the normal. And you'll notice that for the default value, I've set this to just a blank normal value. So for the red and green channels, I have 0.5. And I have a value of 1 for the blue channel. Once again, I've set the alpha to 1. And then lastly here, I want to take a look at this metallic input. You can see I set the default value here to 1. All right, so let's just jump over to another graph, and let's instance this node here into the graph. So this becomes this base material that I've been working on. Now I can just right-click and drag and drop this node to my 3D view. And this is already rendering my material appropriately because I set these default values for these inputs. Now, of course, I can go in and override this. So for example, let's say that I create a uniform color and we'll set it to maybe a green value and I plug that into the base color. So now I have this green base color. However, because I haven't supplied something new to the metallic, that default value that I set for my metallic channel is still in play, as you can see here with this white output in my 2D view. Now, another area this is pretty important is with this ambient occlusion default value. So let's jump back over here to my material and let's take a look at what I have here. So once again, I have an input node. This is an input grayscale and I set the value here to one, which essentially means I'm not supplying any shadowing information to my ambient occlusion. Now, in previous versions of Designer, before we had this default value system, if you were to just add an input value, the result would be basically black. So this is what it would look like you'd have to manually set up the node system to account for this input being black. However, now with Substance Engine V8, we can always come in and just set a default value here. So that's how the default value system works. As you can see, it's pretty straightforward. You simply can just set default values in all your input nodes. And this is going to be very helpful when you're creating your own custom materials, as well as your own tools and filters and generators. So that's going to conclude this walkthrough on Substance Engine version 8 features that are part of Substance Designer 2020.2. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you next time.